Introducing History on the Rocks, the podcast where history meets your favourite drink. Join Cody and Audrey every Thursday for a journey through time, flavoured with the fascinating tales of history and a splash of your preferred libation. Hosted by the charismatic Cody and Audrey, each episode dives into intriguing historical events, figures and moments, all while savouring the essence of your chosen spirit. From the Founding Fathers to the origins of everyday sayings, Cody and Audrey blend the past with the present, one sip at a time. So sip alongside them as they explore the intoxicating tales of yesteryear. Whether you're history buff or simply a lover of a good drink, grab your favourite drink, kick back and get ready for your journey through the fascinating yet relatively unknown slices of history. So join Cody and Audrey every Thursday on your preferred podcast provider to learn about the past while sipping in the present. Cheers to History on the Rocks. Taphophobia is the fear of being buried alive. Although probably not a worry rooted in much truth today, being buried alive used to be a lot more common. In the absence of medical technologies and marks, ways of determining whether someone had really died ranged from pinching to burning. Even then, sometimes the person had simply entered into a coma or was paralysed. It wasn't until 1846 that French doctor Eugène Bouchot suggested that they use new stethoscope technology to listen for the existence of a heartbeat and proving death became more certain. Unfortunately for the poor souls of these stories, they weren't so lucky. Being buried alive is a primal fear that grips one's very core, triggering a cascade of panic and terror. Imagine, if you will, the suffocating darkness pressing in around you, the weight of soil bearing down like an insurmountable force. With each breath, desperation tightens its grip, fueling frantic attempts to claw your way through the earth above, or pound or scratch at the thick wood coffin. Your heart races, pounding against your ribcage, as adrenaline courses through your veins, urging you to fight against the inevitable fate that threatens to consume you. Every moment feels like an eternity as you struggle against the confines of your earth and prison, driven by a primal instinct to survive. But with each passing second, hope dwindles, and the chilling resolution sets in that escape may be impossible, condemning you to the fate of eternal darkness and solitude. Hi everybody, and welcome back to the Dark History Podcast, where we explore the darkest parts of human history. Hope everybody is well. I'm Rob, your host as always. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 7, Six Feet Under, Unearthing the History of Being Buried Alive. So we're back this time, with a more morbid and dark tale. In this chilling exploration, we delve into the terrifying tales of historical accounts of individuals who face the unthinkable fate of premature burial. From harrowing accounts of accidental interments to spine-tingling anecdotes of narrow escapes, we uncover the dark and macabre realities of being laid to rest before one's time. So grab your shovels and prepare to dig deep into the eerie world of the premature burial. Before we start, I just want to say a quick thank you to today's sponsor, the History on the Rocks podcast. Without further ado, please turn off those lights, sit back and relax next to the fire for more dark history. To start, let's travel back in time to the bustling streets of London in 1661. A city teeming with life yet shrouded in shadows and uncertainty. Amidst a clamour of Newgate Market, a butcher by the name of Lawrence Cowthorn 
and what suddenly became the protagonist of a nightmarish tale that would haunt the collective psyche for centuries to come. His harrowing ordeal, chronicled in the pages of a pamphlet ominously titled The Most Lamentable and Deplorable Accident, recounted the fateful events that unfolded on this seemingly ordinary day. Little did Lawrence know that his routine journey would lead him to the brink of a fate far worse than death itself. The horrifying prospect of being buried alive. In 1661, London was a bustling metropolis, characterised by narrow cobblestone streets, timber frame buildings and towering church spires piercing the skyline. The cityscape was a tapestry woven with a mixture of grandeur and squalor, with opulent palaces neighbouring squalid tenements. The River Thames flowed through the heart of the city, serving as a vital artery for trade and transportation. London was a hub of commerce, with bustling markets like Newgate Market teeming with activity. The city was also the centre of culture and politics, home to theatres, taverns and the Royal Court at Whitehall Palace. Despite its vibrancy, London in 1661 was also plagued by poverty, disease and social unrest, with periodic outbreaks of plague casting a pall over the city. It was a time of contrasts and contradictions, where the allure of prosperity mingled with the spectre of adversity, shaping the fabric of life in the capital of England. In the heart of the bustling Newgate Market, Lawrence Cowthorn toiled as a journeyman butcher. His days consumed by the sights and sounds and smells of the marketplace. He was a solitary figure, and he resided in the humble abode of Mrs Cook's boarding house, a place devoid of luxury, but providing the basic shelter he required. However, fate took a cruel turn when illness befell Cowthorn, rendering him bedridden and unable to work. Seizing upon the opportunity, his landlord concocted a sinister scheme to hasten Cowthorn's demise. With greed as her guide, Mrs. Cook saw an opportunity to profit from Cowthorn's misfortunes. His unpaid rent loomed large in her mind, and she saw his passing as a convenient means to open up a bed for a paying tenant. Moreover, with no kin to claim his possessions, she stood to inherit whatever meagre belongings he had possessed, but only if he drew his last breath within the confines of her establishment. Thus, Cowthorn's fate was sealed, trapping him in a web of deceit spun by those who he had entrusted with his care. As days turned into a blur of feverish agony, Cowthorn's condition deteriorated, his weakened pulse barely a whisper of life. Ignoring the faint glimmers of hope that flickered within him, Mrs Cook wasted no time in declaring him deceased eager to rid herself of the burden he had become. Three days passed, marked by the eerie silence that enveloped Cowthorn's room, until finally, the pronouncement of his death echoed through the halls of the boarding house. With solemn efficiency, his lifeless form was entrusted to the undertaker's care, destined for a final resting place beneath the earth's cold embrace. But as the final clods of earth descended upon Cowthorn's makeshift tomb, a gut-wrenching sound shattered the silence. A desperate cry for salvation emanated from the depths below. Horror seized the hearts of those present, as realisation dawned that Cowthorn was not yet lost to the realm of the departed. Frantic efforts ensued as the undertakers hastily dug through the freshly turned soil their shovels slicing through the earth in a race against time. Yet their efforts were in vain, for when they finally breached the confines of Cowthorn's coffin, 
they were met with a sight that would haunt them for years to come. Within the confines of the wooden prison, Cawthorn's once serene countenance was twisted into a mask of terror and despair. His fingers, worn raw from desperate clawing, bore testament to the frantic struggle for freedom that had consumed him. The remnants of his burial shroud lay in tatters around him, torn asunder in a desperate bid for escape. His head was bloody and battered from his repeated headbutts to the coffin lid. And yet, despite his valiant effort, he had succumbed to the relentless grip of mortality. His life extinguished in a cruel twist of fate. As they gazed upon the tragic spectacle before them, the Undertaker could not help but wonder at the cruel irony of Lawrence Cowthorn's demise. His landlady was accused of premature burial, and the story was immortalised in myth and legend for hundreds of years. In a quaint village of 17th century England, nestled amidst the rolling hills and tranquil pastures, resided Mrs. Blunden, a woman of ample proportions with a penchant for the finer things in life. Her husband, a malt dealer by trade, often found solace in the bottom of a tankard, while Mrs. Blunden favoured the warmth of brandy to ward off the chill of loneliness in his absence. It was on a fateful day, the 15th of July in the year of 1674 to be exact, that tragedy struck the Blunden household. With her husband away attending to business, Mrs Blunden succumbed to the allure of poppy water, slipping into a deep slumber of which she would not easily awaken. Concerned for her well-being, the family summoned the local physician, who, upon administering a cursory examination, deemed her dead. With solemn efficiency, preparations were made for her interment. Her husband's absence prompted a request for postponement until his return. However, the family, eager to expedite matters, proceeded with the funeral arrangements without delay. In a macabre scene that would haunt the memories of those present for years to come, Mrs. Blunden's substantial frame proved a challenging fit for the confines of her coffin. With great effort and a crude stick to prod and push, they managed to secure her within the wooden vessel, sealing her fate with a finality that belied the horrors yet to unfold. Two days passed. The mournful tolling of church bells mingled with the laughter of children at play in the nearby graveyard. It was amidst their innocent frolics that a chilling sound pierced the tranquillity of the cemetery. A muffled voice emanated from beneath the earth. Curiosity procured, the children pressed their ears to the ground, their hearts pounding in their chests as they listened to the desperate cries for help echoing from the the depths below. Yet, when they shared their harrowing tale with an adult, their words were met with scepticism and scorn. Dismissed as fanciful imaginings, they were chastised for spreading falsehoods, their youthful innocence no match for the rigid disbelief of their elders. It wasn't until the headmaster himself ventured to the grave, spurred by a nagging sense of unease, that the truth of their claims were laid bare. With trembling hands and bated breath, the headmaster listened intently, his heart pounding in his chest as he heard the unmistakable pleas of salvation raising from the bowels of the earth. Determined to uncover the source of the unearthly cries, he rallied the villagers to his cause. Their collective efforts culminated in a grim discovery that would shake the very foundations of their small community. As the coffin lid was pied open once more, a sense of horror greeted their eyes. Mrs. Blunden, her once placid countenance contorted into agony, her flesh battered and bloody 
from her frantic attempts to escape the confines of her grave. Yet even as they befell the gruesome sight before them, it was evident that death had claimed her once more, her tortured soul finally finding release from the earthly torment that had befelled her. In the aftermath of the tragic events that unfolded, the village was plunged into a state of shock and disbelief, grappling with the grim reality of what had transpired within their midst. Yet amidst the whisper of scandal and speculation, justice remained elusive, as those responsible for Mrs. Blunden's premature burial evaded punishment with a dubious defence that their actions had been in accordance with the accepted medical practices of the time. Hidden among the labyrinthine streets of Lugern lies the solemn sanctuary of Shankill Graveyard, a timeless testament to the passage of centuries and the stories etched upon weathered tombstones. Venture beyond the rusted gates and you'll find yourself enveloped in a shroud of eerie silence, broken only by the whispers of the wind and the echoes of bygone tales. It is here, amidst the crumbling sepulchres and ivy-clad mausoleums, that the legend of Marjorie McCall unfolds, a tale as chilling as the cold embrace of death itself. In the year 1695, amidst the throes of a fever, Marjorie succumbed to the icy grip of death, her life extinguished before its time. Believing her to be on the realm of the living, her grieving family gathered to bid her farewell, holding awake in accordance with tradition before laying her to rest in the hallowed earth of the Shankill graveyard. Little did they know, their final farewell would be the beginning of a harrowing ordeal that would defy all reason and logic. As the moon cast its ghostly glow upon the desolate graveyard, nefarious figures lurked in the shadows, drawn by the promise of ill-gotten gains. Grave robbers, their hearts blackened by greed, descended upon Marjorie's final resting place, their intentions dark and their hands stained with the sin of desecration. With callous disregard, by the sanctity of the dead, they pried open her coffin, intent on plundering whatever treasures lay within. As their grips closed around the precious rings that adorned Marjorie's lifeless hands, they realised they were glued tight to her fingers. With one swift swipe of their shovel, they severed poor Marjorie's fingers from her hand. With this stroke, a miraculous event transpired that would shake them to their very core. With a gasp of breath and a flutter of eyelids, Marjorie stirred from her deathly slumber, her once pale complexion now suffused with a rosy hue of life. Startled beyond belief, the grave robbers recoiled in horror, their blood running cold as they beheld the impossible sight before them. In a desperate bid to escape the unearthly apparition that stood before them, the robbers fled into the night, their hearts pounding in terror as they sought refuge from the supernatural force that had thwarted their nefarious plans. Meanwhile, Marjorie, disorientated, in pain, yet undeniably alive, emerged from her grave, her senses reeling from the surreal nature of her awakening. Returning to the warmth of her home, Marjorie's reappearance sparked a chain reaction of disbelief and astonishment as her husband and children grappled with the incomprehensible truth of her return from the grave. Mr. McCall, upon hearing the unmistakable sound of his wife knocking at the door, was overcome with shock and disbelief, his very sanity teetering on the brink as he beheld the impossible sight before him. With this sight, legend has it, he lost all colour in his hair. In the days that followed, whispers of Marjorie's miraculous resurrection spread like wildfire through the streets of Lurgan, weaving a tapestry of wonder and fear that gripped the hearts of all who had heard the tale. Marjorie McCall would go on to live many more years, and even bring a new baby into the world, 
her final resting place would ultimately claim her once more, and she would be laid to rest in the same plot, this time for good. As you can see, being buried alive was quite a common thing, and people were terrified of it happening so much that safety coffins were invented. A safety coffin, or a security coffin, is a coffin fitted with a mechanism to prevent premature burial, or allow the occupant to signal that they have been buried alive. A large number of designs for safety coffins were patented during the 18th and 19th centuries, and variations on the idea are still available today. Most consisted of some type of device for communication to the outside world, such as a cord attached to a bell that the interred person could ring should they revive after burial. Robert Robinson died in Manchester in 1791. A movable glass pane was inserted into his coffin and the mausoleum had a door for purposes of inspection by a watchman who was to see if he breathed on the glass. He instructed his relatives to visit the grave periodically to check that he was still dead. The first recorded safety coffin was constructed on the orders of Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick before his death in 1792. He had a window installed to allow lighting, an air tube to provide a supply of fresh air, and instead of having a lid nailed down, he had a lock fitted. In a special pocket of his shroud, he had two keys, one for the coffin lid and the second for the tomb door. P.G. Pessler, a German priest, suggested in 1798 that all coffins have a tube inserted from which a cord would run to the church bells. If an individual had been buried alive, they could draw attention to themselves by ringing the bell. This idea, whilst highly impractical, led to the first designs of the safety coffin equipped with a signalling system. Pessler's colleague, Pastor Beck, suggested that the coffin should have a small trumpet-like tube attached. Each day, the local priest could check the status of the petrification of the corpse by sniffing the odour emanating from the tube. If no odour was detected, or the priest heard cries for help, the coffin could be dug up and the occupant rescued. Another inventor of safety coffins was Dr. Adolf Gutmann who was buried alive several times to demonstrate a safety coffin of his own design. And in 1822, he stayed underground for several hours and even ate a meal of soup, bratwurst, marzipan, sauerkraut, spatzel and beer and a dessert, delivered to him through the coffin's feeding tube. In 1829, Dr. Johann Gottenfried Taberger designed a system using a bell which could alert the cemetery watchman. The corpse would have strings attached to his head, hands and feet. A housing around the bell above ground prevented it from ringing accidentally. An improvement over previous designs, the housing prevented rainwater from running down the tube and netting prevented insects from entering the coffin. If the bell rang, the watchman had to insert a second tube and pump her into the coffin with a bellow to allow the occupant to survive until the casket could be dug up. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this dark episode. You'll be glad to know that this has become less and less common in modern times. I'm not saying it's completely eradicated, you just need to ask Octavia Smith Hatcher, who in 1891 was buried alive after she fell into depression after her son died, fell ill and then into a coma and ultimately died. But of course she wasn't dead, as a mysterious illness swept through the town where she lived. People would fall ill, enter into a coma and then awaken fine and dandy. When her husband saw this, he feared that she was still alive and had her disentombed. Unfortunately, Octavia had died again in the meantime. Even more recent than Octavia's story was the story of Stephen Small. 
Small's Nefarious Tale begins in 1987. Stephen was an Illinois native and an heir to a publishing and media throne. Small was kidnapped and buried alive in a makeshift wooden box near the town of Kankakee. His assailant, a 30-year-old man named Danny Edwards, and his 26-year-old girlfriend Nancy Risch, crafted a plan to abduct him and keep him immobile underground while asking for $1 million ransom from his surviving family members. His kidnappers were able to provide the 39-year-old with minimal air, water and light inside a homemade coffin via tubes, but he was left buried one metre or three feet under a sandy area. He ended up suffocating after his breathing tube failed. Police were only able to locate Mr Small by locating his maroon Mercedes near the burial site. Since Edwards and Rish were convicted, there has been some debate with their testimonies over whether or not the two intended for Mr Smith to die in his coffin. Either way, it was a horrific crime with tragic consequences and Edwards and Rish will most likely remain behind bars for another 27 years. Anyway, if you could please drop a review on the show, it really does help the podcast out. The more reviews, the more the algorithm pushes the show out there. If you think friends and family may be interested in the podcast, then share it with them. Links to all socials are below. I know adverts can sometimes be a pain, but if you would like ad-free episodes, a link to the show's Patreon is also below. Not only do you get ad-free content, here is where you can find my other podcast, This Week in History. This is a dive into the week's grisly, gruesome, or just random events throughout history. The Patreon is for people who want to support the channel, but don't feel like you have to. As always, if you've been listening for a while and not subscribed, please do that. In that way, you never miss an episode. So with all that out of the way, thank you again for listening. Join us next time for our next episode as we delve into another event and more dark history. <laughs>